Welcome to Tea Science Tuesday number three. Today we're going to talk about tea aroma and all the different aromas that tea can have and where they come from and what sorts of things affect tea aroma. Um, so I think this is a really cool topic and if you guys saw the suggested reading uh, that's on my, on my blog ericrscott.com you can see there's a blog post about Tea Science Tuesday with a, a sort of a syllabus. So if you watch the suggested reading um, it was a great video from uh, Sohan from uh, West China Tea Company or uh, Guanyin Tea House in Austin, Texas. And he talked about all the different smells and aromas that tea can have. And I'm not going to go through all of those in detail again like he did. Um, go watch that video if you're interested. Um, but you can get from tea, right? You can get a different smell from the dry leaves um, than you get from the leaves once they've been warmed in a gaiwan. The lid of the gaiwan sometimes will have a different smell than just the uh, wet leaves. Um, yep, definitely. This is a lot more sort of toasty notes in here. And I get sort of more sweetness off the lid of that gaiwan. Um, and you can get a different aroma yet in the hot tea. As the tea cools down, you get different aromas coming out and even in the empty cup. And there are some teas that I have that my absolute favorite part of drinking them is that empty cup smell, is that um, sort of honey fragrance that lingers around in the cup that is just, I think, amazing for certain teas. And it's, it's my favorite part of drinking them, even though, you know, it's not the part most people think of. So if you haven't done this yet, next time you drink some tea, make some tea for yourself, even if it's not Kung Fu Cha style, uh, or anything fancy, you can try to notice the different aromas that you get from different stages of making that tea for yourself. Um, so, where do those aromas all come from? Um, that is the next topic. Um, they come from uh, sort of the, well, what causes them most proximally is um, molecules that are what we call volatile organic compounds. And sometimes that's shortened to just VOCs as an acronym, or I usually just call them volatiles for short. So what are volatiles? They are all small molecules that evaporate at sort of the normal temperatures that tea experiences. So what is that? That's, you know, room temperature, what you're smelling in the dry leaves, to, uh, you know, when it's heated up with boiling water and you actually make some tea. All those chemicals are, the volatiles are characterized just by their ability to volatilize, to evaporate and become a vapor that then you can inhale and smell and detect with your nose. That's all. Um, other than that, they're really structurally diverse. They come from lots of different things. Um, you know, when we talked about uh, caffeine, I had that molecule that I showed you. This is caffeine. And when we talked about catechins, I had some pictures of a few different molecules. But for volatiles, there's thousands, thousands of volatiles in a cup of tea. And there, are, many of them are all structurally not related. And so there's no like one picture that I could show you for what a molecule looks like in this case, which is pretty interesting, I think, and pretty cool. Um, and um, so there's thousands of volatiles in a finished cup of tea, but there are not many of those that you would smell in a just fresh growing tea plant. So it's not like where you go and smell, you know, rosemary or mint or something, and you can smell those volatiles from a distance, right? You can stand near a rosemary plant and you can smell the rosemary or a lavender. You know, if you stand in a field of lavender, it's gonna smell like lavender. If you stand in a field of tea, it's not going to smell like a whole lot. It's going to maybe smell a little bit green, um, but not really like tea necessarily. Now, there's one exception to that that I'll talk about later. Oh, hey, David. How's it going? Um, and hello, Chara. Oh, is this uh, Chara from Tufts? Welcome if it is. Well, welcome if it's not, regardless. So yeah, so like I was saying, if you stand in a, in a field of tea, there's not a whole lot of volatiles that are gonna be released right in the field. Like you can't, it doesn't smell like tea necessarily in the field because there's a lot of transformations that happen when you make a cup of tea. Um, and so um, there's transformations that happen in, in sort of several steps. There's transformations that happen 
um, in the field when the tea is growing. Hello, cup of cha HQ. Um, there's, there's volatiles that are produced um, as a result of the sort of conditions in the field that the tea is experiencing. There's volatiles that are produced during the processing steps and um, different processing steps are gonna be producing different sorts of volatiles. And then um, there's also volatiles that happen, that are produced after the, the processing, main processing that happened during aging or um, fermenting in the case of dark teas. Um, and I'm probably not gonna talk much about aging and fermenting because I think I wanna save those for a different day, a different Tuesday. Uh, I think I mentioned before, there's a couple of really cool papers about um, aging tea and how that affects their chemistry that uh, I want an excuse to read. <laughs> so I might save that for another Tuesday. Um, but I'll start by talking about, uh, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. I'm gonna start by talking about things that happen in the field. Um, and so the example I have of that is the tea that I'm drinking today. Um, it's called Eastern Beauty Oolong. And I have a tin of some Eastern Beauty Oolong that I got from the tea farm that I lived at for a couple of months while I was doing research. And I bring this tin out because I wanted to show you that on the back, I don't know if you can see that, it's not really auto-focusing well, but there is a picture of a leaf with a tiny insect on it. And this tin is actually advertising that the tea inside has been attacked by an insect. And I think that's really cool. <laughs> so they're actually saying, hey look, this tea has been damaged by an insect and that's what makes it good. So Eastern Beauty Oolong, and, and by the way, this is a little bit of an aside, um, but the name, it's, it's sometimes also translated as, as Oriental Beauty. Um, but the name in Chinese is literally Eastern Beauty, like the direction. And it, it's not, it's Dongfeng Meiren. Dongfeng is like the Eastern direction. It's not, it doesn't mean Oriental. Oriental used to mean the same thing as Eastern in English uh, a long time ago, but now they're pretty different words. Um, and uh, so I just go with the, the Chinese translation usually, especially because Oriental in certain situations can be offensive. Um, so that's my take on it. So Eastern Beauty Oolong um, is only produced from tea plants that have been damaged by a specific insect, not just any insect, the tea green leafhopper. Um, its Latin name is Empoasca onuchii, and uh, it's tiny. It's only about three millimeters long as an adult. And what happens when they feed is they have these little straw-like mouth parts um, and rather than using them like a straw, what they actually do is they kind of stick them into a plant and then move them up and down, uh, break open a bunch of cells, and then they salivate this watery saliva that has got a bunch of enzymes in it that starts to kind of break things down. And then they slurp up the juices. Um, and that's how they feed. And then they move to a new spot, do that again. And this causes um, just in that local area causes that spot to kind of turn brown. Um, hey, Lindsay. And um, throughout the leaf, it causes a whole set of symptoms. So the leaves turn yellow. Um, they start to get kind of thickened. Um, and that's not good um, for tea processing because thicker leaves, they're going to be harder to roll and um, they're going to be more likely to break when you're rolling and shaping them. Um, it's also going to possibly, if the damage is really bad, cause the leaves to kind of dry up and die on the edges and the tip and maybe even fall off, which of course is really bad. So this is a pretty nasty pest um, for tea farmers and most tea farmers are trying to get rid of it. But there, like I said, there's certain types of tea that actually um, want this type of damage. Um, Eastern Beauty Oolong is one of them. And the reason why is because when those leaf hoppers attack tea plant, uh, sends out a message that it's been damaged and it sends out a message of volatiles and this is a thing plants do all the time uh, these volatiles in this case attract enemies of the leaf hoppers they attract jumping spiders so jumping spiders can smell these smells and come to a field where there's leaf hoppers and eat them and that benefits the plant and just totally by chance that alarm signal is delicious and it adds this really nice floral um, aroma to the tea. So we take advantage of it, or certain farmers do. So this originated in Taiwan, but I was working on a farm. This uh, is 
Shanfu Tea Company, and they're in Fujian province in mainland China. So this is a style of tea that's starting to gain more popularity and, and start to show up in other parts of the world besides Taiwan. People taking advantage of insect damage. It's really great because all they have to do really is stop spraying insecticides and they have to process the tea a little bit differently because of those thickened leaves. So, um, so that's just one example of how stress in the field can change the volatiles in the tea. Um, and this is actually one of those examples I was saying where you can actually stand in a field of tea that is heavily damaged by leafhoppers and it does actually smell a little bit like Eastern Beauty Oolong. And it's amazing. If you ever have a chance to do that, um, leafhoppers are around in, in June, July, in the summer. So maybe not the, the sort of typical time when you'd go on a, a tea sourcing trip or a, a tourist tea tourism trip. But if you are in a uh, tea growing region in uh, June and July and you have a chance to go to a field that's got lots of leafhopper damage, you'll be able to smell that, uh, that Eastern Beauty Oolong smell a little bit. Now, some of the chemicals that are induced by the leafhoppers are really important, but don't actually have a smell. So one of them is, uh, it's called diene diol one And this is a chemical that is uniquely induced by leafhoppers. So when I say induced, I mean it's produced only after damage. Um, so uh, other insects attack the tea plant and they produce a, their own set of volatiles. The tea plants respond differently for different insects. And for the leafhopper alone, they produce this diene diol one Diene diol one doesn't smell like anything, but during the tea processing, it's converted into a different chemical called hotrienol. And that smells really floral and fragrant uh, I think it's supposed to smell like hyacinth flowers. I've never smelled just pure hotrienol, um, but I believe that's the sort of aroma of it. And that is one of the key aromas of Eastern Beauty Oolong. So the processing is really important for transforming the changes that start in the field into the, the final product that's in the cup. Um, yeah. So I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about this paper, I think just one paper for today that I want to talk about. I love, love this paper. I'm, I'm so, so happy that this exists. Um, hello, Eric Kastman. How's it going? Long time no see. Anyway, this paper is wonderful. Um, I love it for a lot of reasons. One reason is because of the how many different illustrations and figures there are. And like, how great they are like look at this little look at this cute little leaf hopper somebody somebody made that's amazing and then over here there's a tea plant that's got like a weird frowny face <laughs> and it's got volatiles coming out of his head this is incredible right like how often do scientists actually get to express their creative side and have it be actually a really great figure all the figures in here are really wonderful i think um so i, I super like this paper um I think it's behind a paywall. It's not accessible unless you have institutional access or access through your library. But if you need help finding it, you can just DM me and I can, I can help you find it. Um, so why do I bring this paper up? Well, I'm going to use my whiteboard here, for example. So I want to talk about what happens during tea processing. So we'll take oolong processing as an example to start with. So first the, teas get, the, the leaves get withered, so they lose some moisture. And then they get, um, they go through this step called uh, uh, yaoqing, which is sh uh, shaking the green. So you're, you're kind of fluffing up the tea leaves, um, flipping them around, not really heavily rolling them or anything yet. Um, and so what happens is the leaves get bruised a little bit along the edges, but we're not really crushing them. We're just sort of lightly damaging them, bruising them. So what happens on a cellular level? This is a tea cell, a plant cell, generic plant cell. Um, it's got on the outside, this is the cell wall, a rigid cell wall. And inside there, there's a thin layer that I sort of didn't really draw, which is the, the cell membrane. And most of plant cells is taken up by this organelle called a vacuole. And it's a, just kind of a sac that mostly carries water, but it also has other things in it. And so in this case, we've got these dark blue and light blue dots representing precursors to volatiles. So these are things that um, will turn into volatiles um, if they can come in contact with these enzymes. So these little Pac-Man guys are enzymes. Enzymes are molecules that 
help chemical reactions along. And so what happens when we're gently bruising the tea leaves is the cell wall stays intact, but we're breaking this vacuole open. Um, so we're disrupting this vacuole. And what happens then is we've got a different set of enzymes inside the cell, in the cytosol, that's what this area is called, um, compared to ones in the cell wall. And so these, these enzymes in the cytosol now, these dark blue ones, can start to interact with these dark blue molecules. And when they do that, they release volatiles. Now these light blue ones, they don't release volatiles yet because the enzymes that interact with them are over here in the cell wall and the cell wall hasn't been disrupted. So if we were to do black tea processing instead, in black tea processing, you're really crushing those leaves, really trying to get those juices out and you're damaging a whole lot more cell walls when you do that. And when you break open these cell walls, it kind of releases these enzymes that are associated with the cell wall. And now we can get these light blue uh, molecules interacting with these enzymes and releasing a different set of volatiles. So we've got volatiles coming from two different places here. Um, and it depends on how much damage those cells have, uh, which volatiles they give off. And just to show you that I'm not totally making this up, basically what I was drawing was one of the figures in this paper that I really like. <laughs> so this is uh, figure five in here. And uh, if you find this paper, which I will put in the uh, YouTube description when I put this up, um, or I'll put the, the citation for it, you can find it. You can read more in here about what exactly is going on technically. Um, so, so just, we've got different, different sets of reactions going on. Now this paper also thinks about what happens after the kill green step. So in T there's this kill green step where you denature the enzymes with heat. They're no longer functioning, but then there's a different set of reactions that's going on that doesn't involve enzymes. So, you know, one really great example of that is um, when teas are roasted, you get a whole different set. But even if they're not roasted roasted, there's still some reactions going on during that kill green step where there's a hot pan or a hot oven or steam or something like that um, that can cause breakdown of chemicals or can cause new chemicals to form through different sorts of reactions. So you've got reactions that happen when the enzymes are working and when the vacuole is disrupted. You've got a different set of reactions happening when the enzymes are working and the cell wall is disrupted. And then you've got a third set of chemical reactions that are happening when the enzymes are still working, or I'm sorry, when the enzymes are not working um, and there's some heat being applied to the tea. And you can basically think of the length of those three different types of reactions as what determines the differences in the smells of different teas. So white tea has a really, really long time where the enzymes are working but the cell walls aren't disrupted. You get maybe a little bit of the vacuoles being disrupted because it's um, getting damaged a little bit and these plants are getting stressed as they, as they wither um, and that's causing some damage. But that's it, right? There's never a kill green step, so you don't get that heating, those reactions from heating, and you don't get any crushing or rolling. Black tea, on the other hand, you're really just getting those reactions that happen from the crushing and rolling, and a little bit maybe uh, when it's drying or something from those, those uh, other uh, enzymes that are non-enzymatic. Um, green tea, you're getting just those reactions from the, when, after the enzymes are denatured, after the enzymes aren't working. So just understanding that is really cool. And one of the things, so I heard about this research from a friend before this paper was published. A friend of mine went to a talk by the, some of the authors. And it really got me thinking about how we categorize tea. And I wrote a blog post about this on, on teageek.net called uh, Oolong, More Than Mid-Oxidized. Because we usually tell people, oh, Oolong is in between green tea and black tea. Um, but if you think about the sort of biochemistry of it, um, Oolong is a lot more like white tea than it is like anything else because it has that really, really long step where the enzymes are still active, but you haven't disrupted the cell walls. 
Um, that's the thing that they have in common. And that's why those two categories of tea are oftentimes the most aromatic, the most complex in, in aroma, I think. Um, I have another paper which sort of tries to, to categorize that. Uh, I didn't read this one carefully, so I won't talk much about it, but I will just show this, this figure here from this other paper. Um, here, I'll show you the title in case you want to look at it, find it later. You can take a screenshot or whatever um, from a food chemistry journal. Here's the figure. Um, so this is on the bottom. Let's see, bottom is number of compounds, and then the top is concentration. And then we've got the different types of tea. So just from this, you can see that white tea both has a really high concentration of volatiles, but also a pretty big diversity of volatiles. And oolong also has a really big diversity of volatiles, lots of different chemicals being produced compared to like green tea, for example, that has a lot fewer chemicals being produced, a lot simpler aroma uh, bouquet. So, that backs up what I just said with numbers, but uh, I, again, I haven't read this in, in super great detail, so I can't really super, can't really comment on um, how accurate that is or how, how generalizable that is. Um, so let's see, what else was I gonna talk about? So you guys can like interrupt and ask questions, by the way, too, if you're watching live, I'm happy to interact with people and uh, all that. Uh, let's see, I talked about Eastern Beauty Oolong, I talked about processing, um, and yeah, so I guess the last thing that I'll, I'll mention um, before I wrap up is thinking about why there's different smells, going back to the beginning, why do we get different aromas from dry leaves, from uh, wet leaves, from the lid of the gaiwan, the, the hot tea, the empty cup? Yeah, I've got that empty cup smell now. Yep, it's different. It's more, this, it's almost kind of cinnamony in this. Um, why do we get different aromas if it's the same thing? <laughs> well, those volatiles that I mentioned at the beginning, um, and I defined them as being chemicals that can evaporate sort of at normal temperatures. Well, they're not all equal, right? The, the, the volatility, how readily they evaporate at sort of regular temperatures, that varies between the chemicals. And so if you've got dry leaves, some of those volatiles are locked away in the leaves. Uh, some of them though are more volatile and will evaporate sort of readily. And those are the ones that make it to your nose when they're just dry leaves. When you warm it up, you get some of those less volatile compounds that need a little bit of extra energy, a little heat energy to help them uh, evaporate. You get those too. So you get now a different blend of volatiles that you're smelling. Um, and then, when you brew the tea, some of those chemicals are gonna be more water soluble than others. And so some of them are gonna end up uh, in a greater concentration in your cup compared to in the dry leaves. Um, you're extracting them preferentially because some like water, some don't. And so you're gonna get, again, a different blend of chemicals. Now the one that I have the most difficulty explaining is that empty cup smell. And it's so different sometimes than anything else any of those other smells. And I don't have a good answer for why that is. I know that with poor tea, you very often get this honey aroma in the empty cup. And there's a chemical in poor tea that we um, find in, in our research um, in really high concentrations in, in specifically in poor, and it's called um, phenylacetaldehyde. And it has a really honey aroma. It's actually found in honey also. Um, and so we think that that might be what that empty cup smell is, but why do we really only detect it in the empty cup? I'm not sure. I don't have a good answer for you for that. Um, but when you're smelling a smell, when you're smelling one of these tea aromas, you're actually smelling, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of chemicals all at once. And your brain is sort of aggregating that all into just a few flavor notes and that you can like process with your brain, right? And so changing the blend actually can change the smell you get. Changing the concentrations of compounds can change the smell. Another, another good example of that, there's a chemical in tea called indole. Indole in low concentrations smells really pleasant and floral and nice, but in when high concentrations, it smells kind of like poop. 
Um, so it's never in that high of a concentration in tea and it's dilute enough that it smells like, uh, it smells like flowers and it's nice. Um, but that was just an example of how, you know, getting different concentrations in these different parts when you have the tea brewed versus when you have the dry leaves, different amounts of those chemicals are getting to your nose and that's what's probably resulting in these different smells. So, uh, anyway, tea aroma is super complex, super interesting to me. It's, um, Big part of my PhD research is looking at the volatile compounds in tea plants and how they're affected by, you know, different aspects of the climate and uh, insects like these leaf hoppers that I talked about before. So really been great to talk to you guys about it and I hope you learned something and next time you uh, have tea with someone, you can encourage them to smell all these different stages of tea brewing and you can tell them a little bit about tea processing maybe and uh, how uh, those aromas get created. So uh, unless there's any questions, I think I'm gonna wrap up for today and uh, go do some writing. So thanks for coming everyone. And uh, I'll put this up on YouTube afterwards so you can share with people if you enjoyed it. Um, the, it's gonna be on the Tea Geek uh, YouTube channel. So if you just keep an eye out for that, subscribe to it. Um, there's already two videos up there one about caffeine and one about aftertaste. And then I'll put this one up uh, sometime by the end of the week. So, all right, thanks for coming. Bye.